Yeah, there might be a half a billion people becoming climate refugees in the next century. And why are you still building on the land? It's, we all know that's not safe. And the cities underwater can be safe if they're properly engineered. The floating projects that we design need to be safer. So not just as safe, but safer than the neighboring coastal communities. And if you take that as a starting point for your design, the floating city can even become, and that may sound very contra intuitive, but the floating city may become a flood shelter during, the, during these conditions. It's a transition from fighting against the water to more living with water. A more integrative blue economy model that also creates a symbiosis between the coastal communities and the cities on the water. For me, maritime urbanism is planning and development of maritime cities, so floating cities, and, and the sea gives us a second chance to do things right. But we should not repeat the mistakes that land cities have made. Making these buildings completely self-supporting in terms of energy, but also a closed water cycle, so that we wouldn't have any negative dis- discharge into the environment. The biggest floating project we have in the Netherlands is a floating neighborhood of 100 houses, which is great, but it's way too small if you compare it to the challenges that we're facing. So I think we want to talk now about at least a thousand houses or 10,000. So we want to, we need to scale up to show that it's not only technically feasible, but that these solutions can also be provided at a scale that really matters. It might be a very good idea to start investing part of your investments, not only on the land, but also in this new blue economy. Welcome to the Blue Economy Primer a New Orleans-based podcast where you learn from the experts the practical tools and solution sets that will empower your community to adapt and thrive in a new blue era of rising seas and economic discontinuity. Today we are speaking with a pioneer and leader with more than 15 years of international experience in the fields of design, engineering, and policy for climate-resilient floating urban development. His mission is to provide floating city technologies to hundreds of millions of people who are impacted by climate change and sea level rise, realizing that these breakthroughs need to happen during this century while also achieving positive ecological and social impacts. Rutger, thank you so much for joining the Blue Economy podcast. Could you please introduce yourself to our audience? Yes, uh, thank you very much, uh, Greg, for inviting me. It's a big honor to be part of your podcast. Uh, my name is Rutger de Graaf. I'm a civil engineer from the Netherlands. I grew up in a small town, three and a half meters below the sea level. And after my graduation at uh, TU Delft uh, as a civil engineer, I started uh, Delta Sync, my first company. That's now 17 years ago. And from that moment, uh, I've been working on floating structures, the engineering and design of floating structures, flo- floating projects. And has kept me quite busy uh, ever since. Great. Is there anything you can tell us about maybe from your past or how you grew up that led you to this work? Yeah. So, so yeah, I, I grew up uh, below the sea level in a polder. Uh, like many Dutch people do, I didn't realize it in particular as a child, uh, because it's quite normal for us to do so. But certainly I've always been very interested in water, doing a lot of fishing, sailing, all these kind of things. And of course, as a civil engineer at the TU Delft, I was educated by you know the professors that are specialized in building dikes, storm surge barriers. So I, I got all that knowledge. Uh, from yeah, world-leading authorities in the field. Uh, and I found that very interesting. But always in my studies, I thought, hey, would there also be more other strategies how you could deal with the water? So instead of fighting against the water, what we have done is, is in the Netherlands for, for hundreds of years, uh, yeah, could we also have, in addition to that, not to replace that, but additionally also a more adaptive strategy, more that you can live with the water, even you can live on the water. Yes, and that has fascinated me. And I think that's that was the reason why I started uh, back in 2006. Yeah, with a team of students back then at in Delft, uh, our company, um, uh, Delta Sync, that was completely specialized already back then in design and engineering of floating projects. Well, I got to work a little bit with Christina and Bart back in the day for yep. the French Polynesian project, and that, w- that was a real pleasure. Are there any are there any key benchmarks or statistics that crystallize the carbon or and or climate crisis for you, perhaps related to these inevitable impacts on coastal communities and around the world? Yes, I think what you're seeing is, of course, uh, yeah, with all the IPCC reports that are being published. Uh, also this week, there was another one. There are not so many people around that really, I think, question uh, what is happening, or what the direction is, uh, where it's going. Of course, uh, the, the amount of sea level rise that we're facing in 2100, uh, we don't know exactly, but that it will have an impact and that climate change al- already has an impact on coastal communities today. I think it's becoming more more apparent to many people. Uh, and not only sea level rise, but also more extreme storms, droughts, uh, extreme weather. Uh, extreme weather impacts are you know, very significant, and substantial all over the planet already. I think it's getting worse also because more and more people are starting to live in urban areas near the coast. Already 50% of the world population is uh, living within 100 kilometers from the coast. And that percentage is, is rising, actually. So uh, notwithstanding climate change, more and more people move to the coast because that's where the op- economic opportunities are. That's where the jobs are. The total size of urban area will more than double in this century. So urban growth continues. 
in particular in flood vulnerable places. Uh, so I think all of these trends that are happening yeah, are reasons uh, why floating becomes a more interesting uh, solution for many stakeholders, uh, investors, but also uh, people working at governments, local governments, national governments, uh, all over the world. And I think that's, of course, uh, interesting for companies such as Blue21 so that we can uh, yeah, provide and help at, at these different locations with our technology and the knowledge that we have. So what does the blue economy mean to you? And how do emerging regenerative ocean-based technologies figure into your future worldview? Do you, you place particularly importance on this sector or, or is that a particularly of interest to you, that blue economy concept? Uh, cer- certainly very much so. And I think and for me, of course, there's already a lot of economics development on the oceans and on the seas taking place. But I do think there's still much more potential. Uh, so uh, if you look at the North Sea, for instance, uh, in the Netherlands, there's already uh, offshore wind. We have oil and gas. We have fisheries. There, there's many things happening. Shipping. But of course, yeah, the, if you compare it to how busy it is on the land, there's still potential to do it in another way, also a more integrated way. Regeneration is a very important principle for Blue 21. And we have done also much research uh, on this as well. Uh, what we see is that uh, floating platforms can also, they have the, the possibility and the potential to create new aquatic ecosystems. So what we have been doing with our sister company in Dymo is that we have investigated the ecological impact of floating structures. So basically we were curious what's, what's happening under those structures. What we found was that uh, in many cases we see new ecosystems, uh, mussels, shellfish, small fish, uh, hiding under these floating platforms. So a little bit to our surprise, we, we we found that in many cases, there seems to be a positive ecological impact because of these floating structures. And if, of course, you compare that with the more traditional approach of land reclamation, where you basically have a big sand fill, where the aquatic ecosystem completely disappears, we think there's a big potential there, how floating structures could help creating more ecological habitat as part of the blue economic development. I think that's an important one. And also, of course, uh, floating also enables you not only to live on the water, but also to have uh, aquaculture, to have uh, floating algae and seaweed systems that could take out CO2 from the atmosphere. That can be buildings, building bricks for um, a circular economy on the water, a blue circular economy. So I think yeah, the water is where we came from as humanity, but it also offers many opportunities for new and more regenerative uh, forms of um, yeah, economic development. And I think yeah, floating structures is an important tool in the toolbox. It's not the only technology, it's also not, but, but it's definitely an important technology that would enable these kind uh, of, of blue economic developments, I think. Are you familiar with or have you been following anything related to specifically the United States or the Gulf Coast with regard to these technologies that you're following and involved with? Uh, n- not very specific. Of course, uh, I'm interested in, in anything that happens in these fields all over the world. So I've been reading, of course, I've been reading uh, things about it. But I don't think I have the, yeah, the detailed understanding about the blue economy, the Gulf Coast that, that you you have for the people from your network. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Um, but but yeah, for, from a distance, if I look at it uh, and compare it with the North Sea, of course, the similarities, there are many differences, but also similarities. I think, of course, also the Gulf has a very uh, long history with regard to oil and gas. A big tradition uh, in these fields, like what we also have in the North Sea, uh, uh, port areas that are also very much uh, anchored to, to the oil and gas industry. That's what Rotterdam also is. Uh, Rotterdam is, is our hometown, basically. It's the largest port of Europe. Uh, but still, I think 70, 80% of it is basically related to the oil and gas industry. And what you now see is a transition uh, to offshore wind, offshore solar, um, and also other forms of, of more, let's say, blue economy related um, fields. And I can imagine that very much similar developments would also uh, yeah, be relevant uh, in your region. Yes. Well, in particular, uh, Royal Dutch Shell is actually very active here in New Orleans. So yeah. I'm sure yeah. there's probably some common prob- co- common programs between what uh, Royal Dutch Shell is doing in the Netherlands and what they're trying to I achieve so. on the Gulf. Yeah. yeah. Can you tell us about the field of maritime urbanism? What does it mean and what, yes. are, what are key ways that you are helping to establish the field? Yes, so that's a very interesting question. And I think that for me, maritime urbanism is yeah, the planning and development of uh, maritime cities, so floating cities in our case. And uh, the idea of maritime urbanism really emerged during the Space at Sea project. 
And the Space at Sea project was a project funded by the European Commission. And there were uh, 17 European partners from different countries, both companies, but also research institutes and universities. What was interesting in this project was that there were two sectors coming together for the first time. So on one hand, you had the maritime engineers and people from the shipbuilding and the oil and gas sector. And on the other end of the table, you had people from, let's say, the land-based people that were specialized in urban planning and, and land development. And of course, these were two entirely different worlds and starting to talk to each other. And that was that was already very interesting. And, and of course, if you want to build floating cities, uh, you have to deal with land-based building codes. Uh, how, how do you make a safe building? What kind of requirements are there when you make a building? But when you're floating, you also have to deal with maritime classifications and, and also the maritime environment. So what we did in Space at Sea was for the first time to bring these two worlds together to establish basically a new field of expertise, which we have now called maritime urbanism. It's very similar to what we also do at Blue21. So in our team, we're fully specialized in floating developments. But in our team, we have architects and urban planners, but we also have maritime engineers. And that combination, I think, is very unique. I think we're probably one of the very few companies in the world where you have these fields of expertise so closely integrated, even in the same room and working together. And I think both fields of expertise are very important. Eh? So yeah, if you ask a maritime engineer uh, to uh, to design a floating city, and you get a, get a couple of floating barges or oil platforms and nobody wants to live there. <laughs> and if you ask an architect to do that, you get beautiful futuristic pictures, but, but you cannot actually build them. So by bringing these two fields together, you can make a pleasant and nice living environment that's also technical technically feasible. And that's what we're doing at Blue 21. So we want to be, we're visionary, we look ahead, but we also are pragmatic. What kind of real projects can we do today, tomorrow, and to really make uh, real steps towards a floating future. Well, and then as you mentioned, the regenerative component, so then the environmental component as well. Very so. much so. That's very important because I've been a part-time uh, research professor at uh, Rotterdam University of Applied Science for, yeah, for 10 years. And in many of my lectures, I always told the students, if we are going to build floating cities the same way as we are building cities on land, we're not solving anything. Yeah, you're increasing the problem, basically. So, I do think that uh, the oceans and, and the sea gives us a second chance to do things right. Uh, but we should not mis repeat the mistakes that land cities have made, I think. So it's, I think it's important that we, uh, we do it the right way. Uh, indeed, looking at regenerative uh, principles for the economy, for human beings, but also for, yeah, for nature. And, and it's very important to include that in the, in the design principles of, uh, of these kind of developments. Well, I want to remind our listeners that we'll have lots of links and additional information and background. So, uh, Rutger, I'll be following up with you to ask for all the, all the links and, and background yes, information certainly. that we can add to the web page for this particular podcast. So regenerative floating infrastructure is clearly an intersection of many different sectors, including the renewable or blue energy sector. Blue 21 has worked on floating solar installations. How do you see this blue energy sector developing? Yeah, so I think, of course, the water has a huge potential for sustainable energy generation. Uh, if only because yeah, the biggest part of our planet is, is water. So, yeah, I think if we try to solve everything on the land, it will be difficult. But if we have an integrated approach on the land and the, and, and the, the water, yeah, it's probably more easy. Um, yeah, I think I see many possibilities. We've been involved in a floating solar project here in the Netherlands together with the TU Delft, uh, where we have yeah, investigated the potential of floating solar. Uh, we also did research on floating LJ systems. Um, LJ are very, uh, yeah, very efficient in taking CO2 from the atmosphere, but you can also use them to produce biofuels. Uh, so I think that's very interesting. Of course, for a country such as the Netherlands, where there's not always so much sun, it's raining today again. Uh, offshore wind is a very, uh, very interesting one as well. So, so I think that um, floating cities have the potential, if you include these kind of energy technologies, to yeah, to have a net negative, um, net negative uh, energy impact, eh? so that you have a floating city that not only generates energy for itself, but also for maybe coastal communities, uh, and of course. Yeah, that's where we, where we need to go to, uh, I think, if we want to solve uh, the climate issues that and not only adapt to climate change, but also address the root causes of climate change and, and, and see CO2 not as a problem or a waste product, but basically as a resource. Can you tell us about how your work intersects with the Netherlands Room for the River program? Yeah, so I think the Room for the River program was a quite a yeah, very important program, started back in the 90s of the last century. Um, and that was maybe one of the first times when the Dutch took another approach. So uh, as, I, as I told you, um, we have been fighting the water for centuries. 
we're still fighting the water <laughs> and we will continue to fight the water for a long time. But in the room for the river project, it was different because then we said, okay, we can make the dikes higher and higher, but it also means the river will be higher and higher and the risk if something goes wrong increases. So what if we take a completely different approach and we give more space to the river so that uh, yeah, the, the water levels get lower and if there's a flood, it is, has less impact. And so that was a big program that took decades uh, yeah, to give more room to the rivers. And you could say it's a transition from fighting against the water to more living with water. And of course, uh, floating urban development is also part of that process so that we say, okay, and we're not only going to fight against the water, but we also start to live with the water. Or even, and you could consider that next step even, uh, living on the water. So it's more a way of coexisting with the water rather than only fighting it by making bigger storm surge barriers, bigger dikes. Uh, uh, and as I said, it's not an either-or question because in analysis we depend on the dikes, like you in Orleans as well. But it's about building a comprehensive strategy of different measures. So not only relying on the dikes, but also having a more resilient uh, flood infrastructure, more resilient cities, uh, in addition to the dike infrastructure that we also need. So related to that, how do you see the growth in these regenerative blue economy models informing the development of resilient coastal communities, either in the United States or worldwide in that economic sense? Yeah, so I think if you approach something from a monofunctional perspective, uh, so if you say, oh, I'm going to make uh, floating housing, then immediately you get a lot of questions about cost and it might be more expensive than building on the land, and, um, even though you have less flood damage. Uh, but if you take a more, let's say, a multifunctional approach, and I think that's what the blue economy, at least for me, is all about, that you say, I'm not only looking at housing or, or only at, at, at food production or only at energy, but all those things together in an integrative way, you can start also to build uh, multifunctional business cases. So if you create a floating city that not only provides housing, but also uh, takes out CO2 from the atmosphere, you might get carbon credits as an additional business model. Um, and, and also, that's sometimes under-regarded, but a floating, a floating city in front of the coast also takes out the wave energy uh, during storms. So it also protects the coastal communities on the land. So it's not only, uh, sometimes people say, yeah, then, then uh, the rich people escape to a floating city and we're stuck here on the land. Uh, but of course, that's not the point. The floating city can also help protect coastal communities by, by absorbing the wave impact. And so it can help to protect. So it's a way more integrative strategy than just, it's, it's not a single thing like, oh, hey, there's floods and I'm going to live in a floating house. No, it's about a more integrative blue economy model that also creates a symbiosis between the coastal communities and the cities on the water. So it's not an isolated gated community on the water. No, it's, it's about an, a symbiosis between the, the coast and, and the floating city. So obviously you have storms in the Netherlands, but here in the Gulf, we, we have category five hurricanes that we're dealing with now, sometimes multiple times in a year. What so far are you seeing in, as design solutions and how to make sure that this floating infra infrastructure can survive these sorts of extreme storms that we're seeing more frequently? Yeah, of course, that's a very good question. And yeah, for us as engineers, of course, the, let's say local, Environmental conditions are the starting point for any design. Uh, and uh, public safety is the number one value for a civil engineer and a maritime engineer. So there's no engineer that wants to be responsible for something that sinks or something that fails. So for us, uh, and uh, of course, in the Netherlands, we have less severe storms, but our wave conditions are among the most aggressive in the world. So the North Sea is a very hostile wave environment. Um our starting point is that um, the floating projects that we design need to be safer. So not just as safe, but safer than the neighboring coastal communities. And so, for instance, the dike system in the Netherlands is designed on a storm that occurs on average every 10,000 years. So the, the wave height that, that occurs one in 10,000 years is a starting point for the design of the Dutch dikes. So that means that if I design a floating platform with Blue 21 in front of that dike, it needs to be higher than better standard than one in 10,000 years. Uh, so that even if the dike would fill, the people in the floating project, they would still be safe. And of course, yeah, these design standards and local conditions are different for every location. Certainly the wind speeds that you would have during hurricanes in, in, in the Gulf region are way bigger than what we have in the Netherlands. But for instance, we have worked together with TU Delft uh, with one of the, our students he has written a master's thesis at TU Delft where he investigated the feasibility of creating floating high-rise buildings in Hong Kong, where they also have typhoons, for instance. And it appeared that uh, yeah, you could go more than 10 levels high, uh, even withstanding typhoon conditions. 
Of course, you can imagine that you will get huge platforms. They will be very wide, very deep, heavy concrete. Um, but yeah, technically it's possible. So I think that yeah, with everything that's happening in the world in terms of storms, natural disasters, increasingly it becomes clear, at least to me, uh, that the cities on the, on the land are not safe. <laughs> Uh, the cities on the water can be safe if they're properly engineered uh, or at least safer. There will always be very exceptional circumstances, maybe. But at least it's my objective as a civil engineer and also with Blue 21, that if you're in a big storm and the cities on the land are flooding, that the floating city is still safe. And so it needs to be safer than the city on the land. And if you take that as a starting point for your design, the floating city can even become, and that may sound very contra intuitive, but the floating city may become a flood shelter during, the, during these conditions. And actually, uh, it also happened with the floating pavilion, the first project that we designed in Rotterdam. Uh, so last year in February in the Netherlands, we had the worst storm in 40 years. Nothing close to what you probably have maybe every two years, but still for us, it was a big thing. Uh, parts of the city of Rotterdam were flooded. And then on the same day, uh, we had a video of what happened to the floating pavilion and it was just perfectly stable sitting there in the waves. Uh, so you could have been sitting on that specific day, you could have been sitting on the floating pavilion, just having a beer, watching football, whereas big parts, part of the Rotterdam city was just flooded and cars were floating around. And so that's the difference. And I think I get a lot of questions now about safety of floating project, but the more and more we see these comparisons that on the same day, part of a land-based city is flooded and the people in the floating project are still perfectly safe then this psychological mechanism can also work in the other direction. And then maybe 20 years from now, people are asking, like, hey, why are you still building on the land? It's, we all know that's not safe, right? Why, why don't you make floating structures? Right. I think there's a big transition going on at the moment in terms of perception of the safety of these kind of, uh, yeah, both the, per this, the perception of safety of land-based cities, but also the perception of safety of uh, floating cities. So with regard to this customization of the designs and the engineering for the particular site, I had the the wonderful chance to work with your team on the French Nut Polynesian project, yep. and I'll be sure to include some graphics and a link to the flyover yep. video as part of the webpage here. But can you tell us a little bit about that particular design and what was unique about it, and what was the the some of the features of the design that that Blue Twenty One produced for French Polynesia? Yes, very much so. Um, so, so my team was involved in that project. It's, we're still very proud of, the, of that project and the work that we did. Uh, yeah, we didn't get a chance to realize it, but who knows? Uh, maybe we were just, uh, the timing was not completely perfect, but uh, I still think it was a good proposition. And I think uh, we were responsible for uh, the architectural design. What we tried to do was to make uh, yeah, a, floating, uh, a floating structure that kind of blends into the, the natural environment. Uh, no, so not something intrusive, but something really inspired on the natural landscape. Uh, we also took into account uh, yeah, uh, local design conditions and local cultural cultural conditions, like the, uh, the the influence of the waves and the stars and and everything that's culturally important in French Polynesia. I think what was also very unique is uh, yeah, really the zero impact or even positive impact of the design. Um, of course, in French Pol Polynesia, you're talking uh, about corals. So we had a very sophisticated methodology to assess environmental impact, making these buildings completely self-supporting in terms of energy, but also a closed water cycle so that we wouldn't have any negative discharge into the environment. Uh, we developed calculation models to evaluate shading effects on the, on the sea bottom uh, so, so that we would not disturb, uh, let's say, the, the maritime, uh, the marine life. And so I think the sustainability and also the, yeah, let's say the the design that blends up entirely in the natural landscape. I think that was very unique, and, and certainly some, yeah, some of the things that we learned in this project we're still applying in other projects today. Wonderful. You have worked in the academic world, the pro professional design and engineering world, and with policymakers on programs such as the Dutch Delta program, Top Sector Water, yeah. and the City of Rotterdam. Can you tell us about the mixed sector cooperative? innovation ecosystem that supports your work in the Netherlands and in other parts of the world where you have worked? Yeah, so I think it's very important to have these collaborations if you want to do something unique because you cannot solve it from one discipline or one sector. So indeed, I always felt comfortable in, let's say, the interface of technical academic research, but also yeah, being an entrepreneur and a businessman and working with policymakers. And I think, yeah, we all have part of the puzzle, but nobody can solve the puzzle just by its own. So in the Netherlands, we... First, we call it a triple helix. So it's basically a triple helix where you 
uh, yeah, you collaborate between uh, entrepreneurs, uh, policymakers, and, and also yeah, uh, these kind of and, and scientists. So yeah, basically connecting research with business with the public sector. And that has evolved into the quadruple helix. And the, the fourth component would then be also to involve local communities and citizens. And I think that's very important to involve all of those groups. I also like to work like that. Of course, it's more difficult in a certain way or more complicated. It's always it's easier for me just to talk to other engineers. And the moment I have to talk to, yeah, to, to policymakers or people from other sectors, it's, it's getting more complicated. But yeah, if you want to really have a big impact, um, there's no other way that you... Yeah, you need to collaborate with other sectors as well. And, and the ambition that we have as Blue 21, creating floating cities, it's only going to work. Yeah. Of course, technology it needs to be technically feasible. But you also have to talk to investors. You have to talk to policymakers about people that need to give the permits. How are you going to finance these kind of developments? How can they be taken into spatial planning procedures? Uh, how do you get enough political support for this? What will local communities and citizens think about it? So there's many aspects that you have to think about. So I think that this quadruple helix approach is really not only very interesting, but also very necessary if your ambition is to realize these kind of projects. And I imagine that because of the Netherlands' rich history in relationship to the ocean, that the banking, the finance, the insurance sectors are all very sophisticated with regard to these emerging or developing floating technologies? Yes. Well, of course, like like anywhere, uh, there's, uh, there's a lack of awareness, of course. Uh, and, and certainly it also sometimes takes time for us to convince a bank to give a mortgage on a floating house. It's not so obvious that they will immediately say yes. I have never met in those 70 years that I'm now working on this. I never met any resistance to what we're doing. But what I did experience was, let's say, ignorance or lack of awareness. So people just don't understand, so they don't give the permit. Mm -hmm. uh, so if you're working at a water board and you need to give a, a permit for a floating neighborhood and you don't want to lose your job, <laughs> uh, yeah, then you face some issues. Uh, you say, yeah, what is this? And I've never seen something like this. But then, of course, if you start to, uh, yeah, to be in a process uh, where uh, these technologies can be explained, not only by me, but also by independent research institutes, uh, yeah, then it starts to work. And the same with banks. Yeah, uh, If they don't know it, they see it as an additional risk and they will ask a higher premium. But if you uh, start uh, yeah, explaining about these uh, technologies and they, they have more knowledge about it, then more is possible than you might think uh, at first. And now we're in a situation that yeah, floating is now part of the national research agenda of the Dutch government. Uh, I'm talking to pension funds uh, about uh, potential investments in these kind of developments. Not that I expect they will do it tomorrow, but still they're interested in what we're doing. And that's also because they see that their real estate portfolios are increasingly threatened by climate change impacts. So for them, uh, if you're a pension fund, you need to about to think about your pension safety in the next 50, maybe 100 years. Yeah, what is climate change gonna gonna look like in that period? Nobody knows exactly. We 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 do know what direction it is going. We experience that, but. And then, of course, in terms of yeah, reducing your risk and diversifying, it might be a very good idea also to start investing part of your uh, yeah, your investments, not only on the land, but, but also in this uh, new blue economy. So what do you think are the obstacles or else what are some of the elements or resources that would accelerate the rapid deployment and scaling of these sort of proven blue technologies and various solution sets for coastal communities and island nations? So what, what, what I see, uh, so we were very happy that uh, last year, uh, floating developments and floating cities were included in the IPCC report, 1,400 pages, but uh, floating urban development is mentioned in a couple of chapters. And our project, the Floating Pavilion Rotterdam, was mentioned in the IPCC report as an example project of climate adaptation. And that's great news because it means, well, it's great news for us as a company, but that's not the most important thing. And the most important thing is that because if, if, if such a group accept this as an option. I expect that it will also become included in national policies and city policies all over the world. So I think that's very important. So to have more awareness for this solution. And even though I'm working on it already for such a long time, I, every day I meet people that, that don't know about it. And, and uh, I think that that's something. And so the lack of awareness. It's also very important to share the knowledge, to distribute the knowledge that we have. This is also the reason why on our website at Blue21, we have created the largest open access knowledge base on floating urban development in the world that everybody's just free to access. You can 
Uh, there's uh, reports there, uh, videos, interviews, uh, you name it. Uh, so we are really much into knowledge sharing. And we don't see it as something competitive. We think by sharing our knowledge, it only increases also our business opportunities because people see what about our capabilities. And also uh, because our ambition is so big, we will never be able to achieve it just on our own. So we need to collaborate. So, so we welcome collaborations with other companies and, and investors and, and also with government agencies. So I think that's very important. So to create more awareness, uh, to work together, to collaborate, to share knowledge. I think these are very important points. And yeah, maybe most importantly, what we need is political leadership. And we have analyzed floating projects that worked out and many who didn't. And what all floating projects that worked out had in common was strong political support. Uh, from a mayor, from a municipal board, uh, from a, a water board, uh, because that creates an enabling environment in which innovators such as me uh, can work. And else you get stuck because you don't get the permit, you don't get the financing. So you really need a political leadership. And that's often lacking, unfortunately, uh, all over the world, also in the Netherlands, it's lacking. Uh, but fortunately, they're also within, let's say, yeah, the political system, sometimes they're pioneers. Uh, sometimes people that don't want to change things, people that, that have a vision. And of course, yeah, that's what we need to, to, to move forward. So yeah, we need uh, the, the private sector and the public sector to work together on, on these kind of technologies in order to accelerate it. So it's about uh, connecting the entrepreneurs and the engineers with the investors, with the people, uh, yeah, the, the pioneering visionary people working in governments. And then we start to be able to do something. Yes, well, we can certainly appreciate that. With the Blue Economy Primer, we're trying to increase that awareness, and that's why yeah. it's so important to be speaking with people like yourself. And again, we'll have links to your knowledge base on your website, but could you tell us that website address so, so folks that are listening can go there? So it's uh, blue21.nl, so it's very simple. And then if you look at resources, you are immediately in our knowledge base, so you can have a look. And uh, So we have, yeah, we have made so many uh, resources available for people that are interested that it can keep you busy for quite a while, I think, if you're interested in this. <laughs> Great. Yes, I will definitely yeah. check it out. So that's blue21.nl, as in the Netherlands, yeah. correct? Yeah. Great. yeah, yeah, exactly. Yes. So we recently had the chance to speak with Frederick Pons about the Indigo Civilization Project. Can you explain to us how that concept intersects with your work? Yeah, so Frederick Pons is uh, he's from France, uh, and he has this initiative to start a really big, uh, not only R&D program, that's part of it, but also uh, action program. So it's, it's R&D, but also really building things focused on, on France. Um, of course, yeah, it's not too far from the Netherlands. Uh, I, I visit the country often. I work together with many people there. And of course, what France uh, has a couple of very interesting qualities. I think um, after the United States, France is the largest maritime area on the globe. Uh, so that's, of course, very interesting. They've, they have all sorts of small islands all over the world with around that a big maritime area where they could uh, apply things. They have a much bigger maritime space uh, than the Netherlands. So that's very interesting. And I also think that France has, of course, a history also with yeah, realizing big projects. And of course, yeah, within the European Union, we also like to work together. So I'm very happy also to uh, to support Frederick in his efforts to uh, yeah to establish this uh, in France. Uh, while at the same time we're working in the Netherlands, but also we're working with uh, yeah, with the Shimizu Corporation from Japan, one of the largest contractors in the world. We're part of the task force for uh, floating infrastructure in Busan in South Korea. Blue Twenty One is uh, we worked with you. French Indonesia. So yeah, we are requested all over the world to for our expertise. And we're happy to not only in the Netherlands, but to apply our knowledge uh, globally. Well, can you tell us what's next for Blue 21 or for you personally? What are you really excited about right now coming up? I, our focus in my introduction, I said, well, uh, it's, it's about uh, 60 years ago that I started with this. And of course, in that time, I think we have delivered uh, the proof of technology. And not only us, but also our colleagues and partners in other companies. Uh, I think that we have been successful in the past 10 to 15 years in, in showing to the world that this is not a science fiction story, but it's real technology. And there's many projects all around over the place that you can visit and yeah, you can go there and see for yourself that it's existing technology. So I think that's great. But our challenge right now is, of course, that we say, if you look at all these projects that have been realized, they're all relatively small scale. So uh, the, the biggest floating project we have in the Netherlands is floating neighborhood of 100 houses, which is great, but it's way too small if you compare it to the challenges that we're facing. So if you look, uh, I think there was a World Bank report where they estimate that uh, there might be uh, half a billion people becoming climate refugees in the next century. Yeah, they're not going to make it with your 100 floating houses. It's just there's a big difference. 
I think the big challenge is to move from the proof of technology to the proof of skill. Our efforts at Blue 21 are focused on not maybe making another floating pavilion or making another 10 floating houses, but really making to increase what we're doing with an order of magnitude. So I think uh, we want to talk now about at least a thousand houses or 10,000. So we want to, we need to scale up to show that it's not only technically feasible, but that these solutions can also uh, be provided at a scale that really matters. I think that's what we want to do. And we're discussing in the Netherlands with cities such as Amsterdam and Rotterdam uh, to, to do this. But also uh, we have a joint venture in Finland, uh, in the north of Europe, where we try to create floating islands uh, between Finland and Estonia as part of a bigger initiative that aims to connect those two countries with a, the largest rail tunnel in the world. We're working there with uh, very successful ent entrepreneurs, uh, the finest bay uh, development entrepreneurs uh, that to also create floating islands there. Uh, so that's one of the biggest things that we're working on at the moment. And also, of course, geopolitically, what's happening in Russia, in the world. Of course, the urgency to connect these countries in Europe, but also to work more together within Europe, more than we already did, has become more apparent. The urgency has increased to do that. I certainly think that yeah, the project that we're, we're trying to to start in uh, in Finland, Estonia, in the Baltic uh, region, is, is certainly the biggest thing that we're we're doing now. But also our collaboration with the Shimizu Corporation, they have just uh, published um, that they will uh, start to realize their project, the Green Float, which is a really big floating city project in Singapore. So uh, certainly also the East Asia market for us has a big potential. Is there anything else that you would like to share with our listeners about your work or the field? Yeah, so I think that probably what's interesting to mention is also yeah, the work that we did with underwater drones. Of course, it's always easy to talk about positive impact and sustainability, but we go one step further because we have established a sister company in Dymo. That's an acronym for Innovative Dynamic Monitoring. And we have done six years of research with uh, underwater drones, under floating platforms, really investigating with underwater drones what happens under the platform. And yeah, what we saw is basically an enrichment of the ecosystems. And these results have also been published uh, in, in a scientific journal now. Uh, so this is also certainly also a link that we can share with you. So we work together with independent researchers that have uh, yeah, confirmed that in many cases we have seen an ecological enrichment of, of uh, yeah, by making floating structures. So I think that's also quite interesting uh, to know that we also have the technology to monitor ourselves basically and, and to make that, that data open access that you can also see with underwater drone images, but also with censoring data, uh, what's happening under those platforms. Of course, an important remark to make is that uh, these projects that we investigated were also relatively small scale. And if we start to make way larger projects, that we need to continue monitoring these projects and to make sure that we still have a good impact. And if we don't, that we learn something from it and have better design principles for projects after that. So we need to be, we need to stay part of this learning process. So it's not that we have tick mark now ecological impact and we're fine. We can go on. No, it's something that we need to be continuing. Uh, we need to continue doing that. What about the project that the Dutch Port Authority is working on in the Maldives? Are you involved with that at all? Or do you have any comments about how that's going or where it's headed? One of our colleagues, Water Studio, we work with him already for a long time. He's also specialized in floating and developments, more from an architectural point of view. We're a little bit more on the, uh, the engineering side. We work with many projects and, and Kuhn has been working in the Maldives for a long time. And he's now realized his first prototype for a floating city in the Maldives. And we see in the press many nice visualization of floating cities and not all of them are realistic, but certainly this one is, is one that's actually happening now. So I think it's an interesting project to look into and I would certainly encourage uh, everyone interested in this topic also to check out the work that Kun is doing in the Maldives. It's interesting. If I remember correctly, the final size of that is about 2,500 people, correct? Yeah, and so if this would be uh, realized that it's, it's planned, so it's now the first prototype that has been realized, that's already a big step, I think. It would certainly be the biggest floating city in the world, so it's very an very interesting initiative. Well, Rutger, this has really been super informative, and the work you're doing is so exciting. I so much enjoy learning more and more things from our guests, but particularly with the work you're doing and the way it all comes together. I Really appreciate your time, and this has been a, a great opportunity to learn more about where the sector is going. So thank you so much, and we'll be sure to be watching what you're up to in the future. Thank you very much, Greg. It was a pleasure to be guest in your podcast, and happy to talk to you. And yeah, looking forward to hear the final result. Great. Thank you for joining us on the Blue Economy Primer. If you enjoyed today's podcast, don't forget to subscribe on your favorite podcast platform. Please help us spread the word, and be sure to visit our website at www.deepblue.com. Dot Academy, where you can find all of our available episodes, access important links and supporting information for each episode, 
Send us your comments and or suggestions for potential guests and topics. Get more information about our community engagement initiatives and join our mailing list, as well as make a much appreciated tax deductible donation to support our nonprofit education and research mission. Thanks again to the Dan Lucas Memorial Foundation and the Pontchartrain Conservancy for their critical financial and institutional support. Until next time, when we meet again on the ever-expanding horizon of the blue economy.